Hi, and welcome to the Rare Business Podcast. My name is Adrian Swinsko, and I'm a consultant, advisor, researcher, and writer on all things related to customer service and customer experience. Through this podcast, I seek out and interview CEOs, entrepreneurs, business and tech leaders, and leading thinkers about what it takes to build organizations that produce better outcomes for both customers and employees in this fast-moving modern age that we live in. If this is your first time listening to one of these interviews, then welcome. And please do dive into the archives at adrianswinsko.com, as I've now completed over 250 of these interviews in the last few years. If this is not your first time listening, then thank you for returning, and I'll aim to do a good enough job to keep you coming back week after week. Anyway, that's enough from me right now. Let's get into the interview. So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have Re Noragard, who is Managing Creative Director at SY Partners and host, no less, of the new podcast, Designing for Humanity. Hi, Re, how are you doing? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I am splendid, thank you very much. So, Re, can you give us a little bit, can you introduce your, uh, yourself to us and tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do, just so we get a little bit of a background sort of sketch? Certainly. Um, I'm a designer by training. I, um, I'm from Copenhagen, Denmark, and that's where I trained as a designer at the School of Media and Journalism. So uh, really a training around how to apply design um, to content and mm-hmm. how the two work together. Um, that's, that, that's my training, but I've always worked in very um, interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary environments with architects, industrial designers, and, and technologists. So, so quite early on, I, I became a creative director in that capacity, really like sitting in the middle of, of many different functions and looking at creativity and expressions across. Um, and at um, SY Partners, I'm, I'm um, a, a creative director, a managing creative director, and, and I work with, with the clients to bring into focus um, the, the future that they want to build so that we can see it and, and go build it together. And more specifically, I am, I am focused on, on transformation through um, inclusion. And, um, and as Inclusion seems to be the the current design frame. Um, I'm finding that the, the definitions and the conversation around inclusive design are perhaps not expansive enough for the very large scale and systemic problems that we, as designers and and creative problem solve, solvers, are finding ourselves um, being asked to to help solve or to participate in. And that's what my podcast, Designing for Humanity, is about, is about trying, you know, starting to explore what might be required of a new design frame that takes into account um, design on, on the, you know, on a, on a global scale, potentially. And so you, you actually kind of um, have answered my second question, which was the, you know, the thing that brought us together is I became aware of your new podcast called Designing for Humanity. And the interesting thing I, I was thinking about when I, when I first learned about it is this, because I'm my primary interest is in mm-hmm. how do organizations sort of create design uh, and deliver better outcomes for both their customers and their, and, and, and their people. So it's kind of a broad uh-huh. sort of church. And but the thing it seemed to me about the the designing for humanity, and you talk about the the inclusive design. It's almost a bit like mm-hmm. you're almost it, it, it feels like with the, with the podcast you're being inclusive in trying to explore this by actually inviting some people to come on and, and actually give their their view on what it means for them and how they've how they've grappled with that sort of challenge. Would that be accurate? Yeah, that's. I think that's absolutely uh, accurate. So I am. I think that what I'm experiencing is that many, many people have parts of the solution through their lived experience mm-hmm. um, and, and by addressing, which is 
by addressing a problem or an issue from many different angles at the same time, I, I'm, 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 I'm starting to do some sense making. Um, right. So yeah. So by being very inclusive in my thinking, I'm, I'm looking for, for signs um, of, of ideas that will be useful towards this new design frame, perhaps or, okay. or not. I mean, that's the thing that sure. with research is you don't know what you're going to find necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> No, uh, that's kind of fair enough. I mean, but just if we can roll back a little bit, I mean, uh, just for mm -hmm. my benefit, I mean, I'm, I guess, uh, I'm not really scared of asking the dumb questions. But so let's, you know, let me that's ask the perfect. dumb questions, yeah. which, which is, <laughs> yeah. can you explain to me, just so we get the right sort of frame and we understand what the, the platform that we're standing on, kind of what is it that you actually uh -huh. mean by sort of design and also kind of humanity I mean, because they're words they're big words mm -hmm. and but they will mean yeah. different things for different people i suspect yes absolutely and that is to me i think well to me that's a three-part question at the moment from where i am in my exploration okay. towards a new frame so i'll start with design what design means in, in this context, it means a method by which to creatively problem solve, um, and, you, and particularly in service of others. Right. So, yeah, that's my, which is a very broad definition of design, but that's my starting point for, for this purpose. I will say that there is a, a, um, a theme in my, both in my podcast and, and in, my, in my work that is also present um, and that I do explore to a certain extent, which is around expression um, and beauty, perhaps. And beauty is a quite difficult word to to um, define and talk about uh, right now, I think. Um, but but the topic of expression, mm -hmm. what makes a solution um, desirable and worthy, et cetera, et cetera, um, is, is also very important, mm -hmm. right? So no process in the world ensures a great outcome we, when, it, when it comes to making things that didn't exist before, for example, mm -hmm. or making something better. And on the other hand, uh, one individual's expression when trying to solve a really complex problem might not either. So I think those are the two dimensions of design, and, 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 I, and, and expression is very much linked to imagination when it comes to, to, to thinking about design in big systems. Um, I think so. So that's a, it's a very different kind of quality and, and requires different conditions mm -hmm. to emerge than the very structured design process, in my, in my belief. Um, and then on the other side, you have humanity. And um, again, if, you, if we take the design frame of inclusive de design, um, it is inherent in inclusion it is also exclusion, right? Yes. So for some, not for others. And I guess, and, and that's my essential, that is the, at the root of my questioning. So when we, and we as the, the, maybe the human race, when we say that we make products for everyone or everyone could be my customer, or uh, then, then we are perhaps being inclusive, but is it, is it true that we can consider everyone and everyone's needs and sure. have everyone as, in, as part of our consideration is that really true and if it is what would have to be what conditions would need to be true for that to uh, for us to be able to think about it in that way because there's a big difference mm -hmm. um, to me and the other meaning of humanity is is um the best in us right like right. what we hold to be um beautiful worthy and true about being human um and i think it's those two things together you know, with with the aspiration of of a uh, spaceship Earth, perhaps, or you know, every every living being, or maybe at least humans on on planet Earth, um, and the the what we know to be beautiful and productive about being human beings. So that's a kind of a long answer, but um, that's actually a four part answer. I guess. <laughs> No, I, th I, I, so thank you for that. I mean, I just because I thought, well, it's, I think it's worthwhile, not making assumptions about what we mean, totally. just to be clear. Absolutely. Um, because, but what you, because what you've actually described is both, 
very aspirational, but also feels quite problematic in the times that we're living in. And therefore, yep. it's, it's, um, and maybe it's also about, there's a link between design and humanity and that designing for humanity and also the agency that firms and organizations can have in terms of identifying challenges and then also being able to um, use that agency to try and solve those kind of challenges in the absence of other agents, as it were. Yeah. So we talked about design, we talked about humanity, and that's going to find, so we understand where we were at. But I guess you mm-hmm. talked about this idea about transformation for inclusion sort of and design and the way they were going about it is not expansive enough. So I wonder if you can help me mm-hmm. in understanding what is the what is it what is the central challenge that you think that we're facing, and 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 that, that you're trying to address, just so I'm clear about right. the two things, and then also kind of what's the objective, as it were. Uh huh. The objective is to help us think about the consequences of design decisions that we're making when we are designing solutions for. A very large scale, global scale, let's right. say, where where we can understand fairly immediately the effects of the decisions that we make in on people and markets and and places uh, uh, that are not in our purview necessarily um, when we're looking at optimizing an, an experience or product for a, a segment of of the population or for a particular someone with a particular user profile. And, and then particularly so, we get we, we you I guess you'll get into intended and unintended consequences with behind all of that as well. Right. Yeah, exactly. So so we we I, I think design in many ways is, is about designing well we're designing the future, right? So we, we approach with an inherently optimistic um, outlook, and we have adopted this, uh, the, you know, this notion of prototyping, and mm-hmm. and prototyping in many ways in the market, right? Like launching and learning, um, and and that's a very useful thing in terms of um, making ideas stronger and better and more powerful. The problem is, especially with with products that are digital in nature, or 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 enabled by technology and connected is that the moment they exist, they exist, right? Right. Um, and, and the effect of the design that is made is, is not something that you can take back. Like that is a, a design frame from physical products, right? You can make something and then the cycle to make it better to a new, have a new generation um, of, of a product is, is, um, defined yes. in, um, by the physicality of it, but that's not true of services, for okay. example. Um, and, and we're seeing that, and we're seeing that in some of our favorite services and, and with our favorite technology companies all over the world now. The, the consequences and unintended consequences of, of business models and technology applied as a neutral um, way to develop a, a product or service, and we're finding out that um, there are many unintended consequences. For example, yeah. That. So let's let's go back to the podcast. And you talked about you wanted to investigate kind of what designing for humanity can mean and and how can we make things more inclusive. So tell me, how, but who you've, who have you interviewed so far? Because you've just started on this journey, really quite early in the in the in the game. But so who yeah. who have you interviewed so far, and what have you learned? Yeah, that's usually my question. What have you learned? <laughs> but I'll, I'll take it. Yeah. Um, so I, I started investigating from the perspective of the discipline of design mm-hmm. and universal design and inclusive design. So uh, practitioners in, in design, um, in universal design, and people who have come into contact with design through the topic of inclusion. So um, one of my, my first victims was Tucker Wiemeister, who was an industrial designer. Um, who was um, We were on a, the same team, actually, a long time ago, a small team um, that made a series of kitchen tools called OXO. Um, 
and that were based on the principles of universal design and essentially sparked a new category of, of kitchen tools and became you know, a transformative and iconic business. Uh-huh. Um, uh, and so to sort of to retrace our steps and see where we came from. Now, what I learned during that very first episode when I asked Tucker about his background and how he came into how he came to understand the power of design mm -hmm. for himself. Uh, he described his um, childhood and with his father being an industrial designer and his mother being a social worker, how that really informed how he looks at design. And he says in the episode, he says, well, design is how we treat each other. And this was a, a, a remark in a conversation, but to me, um, that is definitely a description of this much broader design frame, that it's not just the solutions that we're making, but it's also how we think about how we make them and why we make the things that we make. Um, so if design is how we treat each other, um, then it, I think it helps us think about the, the fact that everything around us is a design, it's by design, the, yes. you know, from nation states to, from nation states to the, to the glass with water next to me, we, we have designed these things, and, which also means that we can redesign them, but, but um, when they appear on that scale and all around us, we sometimes don't notice and we think that they're fixed and that, um, that they're part of, I don't know, almost maybe like a natural order, right? And we see that in social structures a lot when we have to question if the values that upon us, upon which we created a lot of structures, if they're really serving us, and if they're not, we have to change them, which is very hard. Absolutely, um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's but, that, so. Designing uh, is design is a way that we treat each other. I think that I mean, it's just it's a it's a wonderful little kind of snippet, and it reminds me of something mm -hmm. that uh, of a you know, because I think about it from service and experience, and how do we serve our customers uh -huh. and our their their all their experiences and stuff. But it also reminds me of yeah. a, a phrase that somebody taught me uh, some time ago, which says. Um, true communication is the response we get, and mm. and I think it seems to be the same sort of way because sometimes we it feels like sometimes people design things but not necessarily considering how they're going to be. Um, we think we know how they're going to be used, but actually don't really understand how they're going to be used. It's almost a bit like when we communicate. That's sometimes right. we pick the words and we go, "I've communicated well because right. I've picked the right words." We go like. Yeah. But if it's to the wrong person at the wrong time in the wrong context, as it were, yeah. then it does, it's just going to fall flat. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. It's in, it's in, the, in the relationship that you know. Yes. Um, and I think that's absolutely true of, of what I'm saying. Also, see, this conversation is really helping, helping me clarify my thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. Excellent. So like it, it. who else apart from Tucker have you, have you um, yeah. I mean, no pressure. Yeah. I don't want yeah. kind of another so, kind of classic vignette kind of out of it, but you've oh, set the no, bar no. quite high. Yeah, really. no, absolutely. Absolutely. So I've talked to a, a disability advocate, um, um, Sinead Burke, who's actually now she has a column in British Vogue, um, and she talks about how design has impacted her life and in, in two ways. And, you know, she, she stands three and a half foot tall, so navigating life um, a, through that um, or, or, or in, as a grown up. Yes. A grown woman um, at that height just comes with a number of challenges, and she, through her stories, we really start to understand much better um, what we just talked about, which is that everything is designed. Yes. Um, and and but the way that she comes into contact with it just impacts her life in a whole different way than you and I, and 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 um, lets us see that more clearly, and it's super helpful. The other way she comes into contact with design is that she's a fashion blogger, and now you know, part of the, the editorial team at, at Vogue. Um, and so she also talks about her love for design um, and how, and the conversation we're having is how design and fashion in, in this sense is, is a, a, an amazing vehicle for um, transformation in the sense that, that fashion can help us change our idea of what beauty is, yes. who's worthy. Um, and that's a very useful 
uh, idea for mm-hmm. humans because uh, because we we also operate on on that level. And then on the other hand, I'm I'm talking with an educator uh, who's a director of the K through 12 lab, so that's elementary education um, in a, at at the D school at Stanford about design experiments that she's making to create more equitable classrooms, both on that smallest unit, right, teacher to classroom system, and and but also um, using that as a model for those smaller experiments as as a model for transformation of the system. So that's a very different aspect. So how does design show up in in industrial design? How does it show up in disability and in fashion? How does it show up in education? Um, how does it show up in disaster relief? I'm, speak, I, I'm speaking to a, um, a, a consultant to FEMA about disaster relief and how um, um, this consultant has discovered that including designers in the process of imagining what recovery um, looks like from, from disaster has been um, very eye-opening uh, to her. And, and I love her perspective of... Um, She's not. She's not saying that. Oh, with enough post-its, then that that all the amazing people at FEMA will become designers or design thinkers. Mm. Um, she's saying we're great at planning. We're great at projecting, um, but we're not good at imagining what the human experience is, and we're not good at telling stories about how to how to recover. Um, and designers are really good at that. So, so that to me was also very insightful and very important. Yeah. Um, and a, a, an episode that's not out yet, but but up next, so um, I, I'll tell you about it. Is I, I'm speaking to a creative director from um, a design firm that designs uh, a lot of the interfaces that we see in science fiction movies. Right. And this is where I talk about imagination, really. What are the qualities of imagination and, and what are, you know, design is such a powerful tool for imagining the future. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do that all the time in sci-fi movies. Now, it's a very particular kind of future that we mostly see. And uh, we talk about that on the episode, right? Like making art for all these really dystopian versions of the future that we see in science fiction and what that, what that is like, but the ability to imagine the future and to imagine many different futures at the same time is something that that, that type of thing um, uh, is really engaged in. And so that's a very different kind of conversation, but to me also um, a very important aspect. Absolutely. I mean, so it, it seems like the, the um, there's implications for what you're talking about uh, it's almost like a micro and a very macro kind of level but it in in all aspects it feels like i mean it makes me wonder because i'm a i'm very interested in systems thinking mm-hmm. how things are connected mm-hmm. and things and it but it also makes me think about what you're talking about and and how and I wonder if how that's related to sort of systemic design which seems to be and it's this emergent discipline which is smashing yep. together systems thinking and design thinking yep absolutely is that and right i think that that I, yeah no to me absolutely i think that's absolutely i think that's absolutely correct um and i think that the fema example sits right there in the middle of that right, right? the that the ability to um think for very large-scale systemic events and systems for how to, in this case, recover from, from unforeseen or from, from, from what we consider to be disasters, that is different than the ability to, to design the solution for sure. humans um, and for, for understanding uh, behaviors, understanding patterns, understanding um, how to make something work best. It's a very different. It's a very different thing to tap into. So I think you're absolutely right. It is the convergence or the coming together of the two, and or maybe three things, um, because when I when I'm focused on interface design and science fiction, I'm really talking about the ability to storytell right um, in in a, in ways that help us move towards the solution or not. Um, and the stories that we tell visually and and, and not in, in, in writing and, and entertainment so much are 
again, um, they're, they're part of our um, vernacular in a way that we don't necessarily analyze and address all around us, but they reaffirm or challenge our belief around um, our own presence um, in the world and also about what the future may look like. Yeah. Right? So, so very powerful tool. How might we use this tool in a different way to help us paint pictures of the future we, that we actually do want, not not the, not just the ones from uh, where things blow up and everyone need to um, leave the shuttle and get into the escape pods very quickly. Yeah, it's a, it feels like kind of storytelling and becomes a vehicle for change as well. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, that's a it's a it's a very essential human. Um, vehicle for change is um, the, the vehicle of rituals, or, um, and, and we need stories um, around the rituals to help us create change. Excellent. And in so, our belief system, we have stories. Mm -hmm. So, like I said to, to be, you before, I mean, I'm so as I say, I'm, I my primary area of interest is about creating, you know, better outcomes for people mm -hmm. and their. Uh, for customers and and, yeah. and the people that work in organizations and, and that manifests itself in terms of better service and experience engagement and, and things so what do you think are some of the implications of what you're finding out for people with that sort of same focus or people that are in that professional you know within those kind mm -hmm. of swim lanes of service or experience and engagement mm -hmm. So I think the implication, the practical implication, I'm really glad you asked because that's, it's so important to, like, when you open up a big, expansive conversation to go, okay, well, what could my next step be or how might I uh, move forward here too? So I think, I think recognizing that even the inclusion or, or having an expansive approach to problem solving as in what kind of, what kind of thinking, mm -hmm. um, do we need to solve problems? I think that's essential. So whether that's neuroscience or uh, science fiction or behavioral science or um, human factors or microbiology or um, urban planners or um, disaster relief experts coming together with yes. deep expertise in different areas um, to problem solve. Creatively, the more we know, the more we know, and the more we put it, put you know, put minds together, the greater the chance of actually finding um, solutions that are that are perhaps many steps away from what you would achieve if you had fewer perspectives together yes. at one time. So I think that's an implication for everyone who's in the who's in the room or who's around on the table, who's on the project, who do you include? Use a prep frame. Into this, into the process of design and innovation. Mm. Think more expansively about that. Um, I think that's a very useful um, tactic. And then there is something. I mean, we talk about co-design also. There's something about the history of design and the power dynamic of what we call design thinking mm -hmm. right now that is worth um, just stopping and questioning. Um, so when you take a methodology um, that puts you, project owner, company, uh, solutions provider, in the center, um, essentially, right, as mm -hmm. the decision maker, as, as, the, as the entity that frames the problem mm -hmm. and evaluates the solution, then you have a really fixed power dynamic, even when you're saying that you're including your customers or, you know, you're including your entire company in what, what you're doing, then the power structure is set in a certain way um, that really determines the outcome and and reinforce the status quo in many cases. I mean, I think we act, we actually have to look at that uh, yeah. when we're designing for systems. Also, if we're doing it within the ex in, in an existing frame where the, the the structure and the power dynamic is set, we're we're not going to innovate perhaps in the way that's needed. Yeah. So it's it's you know it's fascinating because you you mentioned kind of that and I was thinking about how we understand and sort of frame the problem and use design as part of that and and it reminds me of a time where i used i was this was years and years and years ago and i was working for 
uh, one of the big energy companies. And one of their research team, mm -hmm. a friend of mine worked there, and he was a guy called Steve. And they were looking mm -hmm. at traffic and traffic flows and congestion mm -hmm. and things. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing is that they they decided that the what they were seeing when they were looked at all the data and the flows and they just observed is that actually they went and investigated what they could learn from fluid dynamics to inform how mm -hmm. they understood mm -hmm. traffic flows. Sure. And is that is that is that is that the yeah. is the right sort of kind of uh, am I in the right sort of? Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that idea we we. Uh, I mean, if you look back to obviously the legacy of Buckminster Fuller, right? Yeah. The idea of biomimicry, yes, looking to nature as a way to inform what we're doing. Yes, it's the, it's that, but it's actually the ability to look at um, uh, adjacency. Um, that's the quality here, yes. right? To to under and to study and to understand systems um, that are not the same, but that are next to for and, and mine them for, for available information, mm. and then to see what's transferable to a situation and what's not. So <clears throat> absolutely about biomimicry, but at the same time, we're also looking inward, right? Like we're looking into our own brains yes. um, and, and have a, a greater understanding on how we exist in relationship to the world around us, which is largely why things are the way they are at the moment. Right? Yes. Um, so, so I think it's both. And I think it's one of the big differences and in, in, or one of the, the, the powerful things about this moment is that, that we can, you know, we can look to data that we're generating around us. Um, and and soon, or we are already in relationship with um, artificial intelligence that that will be able to um, generate and analyze data in ways that that our human brains can't really frame at the moment. I mm -hmm. don't think, but we can, and we can understand ourselves a little bit better, and then we can we can look at at systems um, around us and and um, use all of those inputs. To imagine a way forward um, through very um, complex system uh, system oh. thinking. Okay, so I mean, if I build on the last question I asked you around the sort of what are the implications yeah. for people that are have that service experience engagement sort of create design creation and, and delivery things. If I was to say to you that I've got people that are in that that are in those sort of roles have that sort of, those sort of responsibilities and interests and passions and things. And I was to say to you, mm -hmm. well, okay, that's kind of fine. But this feels like it's a, it's, you know, there's, 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 a, there's a lot going on here. There's something where I'm in a, it's a big conversation. I and mean, I guess the, my question would be, yeah. where should they start? Or what should, what sort of things should they start doing to try and, almost embark on this journey and almost like learning a new way of seeing in many ways or thinking? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's, you know, it's, I, I love that we're getting to sort of, yeah, putting, putting one foot in front of the other and where to start. So I'll go back to and really say again, think about who is, who is thinking about it with you. I really think how we structure teams right. um, and how we set ourselves up even within an organization is, is, very meaningful in in generating a new perspective. So, are they people with similar background as you, um, or not? Right? Yes. Do you have the same depth and level of expertise, or not? And to really to start to question and look into what perspectives are maybe missing. It's it's sometimes easier to see what's not there. Yes. Um. So that that to me is always a good starting point. And then there is one. Um, I think there's a, a dimension in design that is very related to the work that we're doing at SYP currently um, is to recognize that we are also the work that we do, right? And so um, we're, if we use good methodology, then we'll be good at projectizing what we're doing. But we are in relation to what we're doing at all times, which R means that you are also the work that you do, or I am the work that I yes. do. And, 
And and so this is where I think Tucker Wiemeister's comment of design is how we treat each other comes in. Mm. Also. So what are the dynamics of your team? What are the conditions for the for for actually making um, the best solution possible? Uh, what's the relationship? How do you work together? And and so the the ability to model what we want, mm. the right response, like you're saying, um, within um, the way we imagine and that we do our work, I think is also um, a very practical way of changing our minds about what design is. Absolutely. Um, and and I think we're 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 seeing that for organizations so much where. Uh, we, as consumers and, and as people working in organizations, we're, we want to have a level of transparency and um, of thinking and doing um, on the outside of an organization as well as on the inside, right? Yes. So that value, uh, you know, the, the values that we um, create a business on that exists between the user and and a service or a company and a customer, that, that they're also true and exist on the inside of the company, from the company to the people that work there, um, from the team to the larger team, um, from the organization to the end user. Um, and I think that's a really, I think it's a really good thing. Mm. Um, because I think it, it addresses something very essential in, in our lives is the ability to um, to be to to bring together aspects of our life and to be a whole person mm. um, and and it's a useful way of thinking when we think about the things that we make for other people too so if we want for ourselves what we want for others or we want for others what we want for ourselves then how do you actually practice that in your work and in how you do your work what a great example thank you so Re, um, I'm just thinking about um, conscious of time and things. And so I wanted to ask you, yeah. is there anything else that you'd like to add that you, that you found out along your kind of journey you think that we mm-hmm. kind of possibly missed out before I ask you my final question? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's an, an interesting question around which there's an episode where I talked to a, um, a, a designer named Kat Holmes and she spent her... Um, life and, and she is dedicating her life to uh, really studying and practicing inclusive design in technology products, mm-hmm. especially um, coming out with a book um, um, shortly on on her journey and what and what she learned while writing this book. And we have a conversation around where where transformation happens within different organizations and. And that's an, maybe another aspect to pay attention to. So if it's a, if it's a company and organization that makes products, then the best way to change the culture of that organization is in how the product is made, actually. Because mm-hmm. that's what informs the whole body that is the organization, right? It's, it's focused on that. It's the, every process is geared towards that, the value um, of um, of individuals and relationship to that um, has to do with with the product and how the product is is made. But that's not true of every organization. It may sit somewhere else, right? right? Like where like where does that change? Where is the you know where are the vital organs, if you will, or where where are the beliefs held? Um, it's different from organization to organization. So when we talk about how to you know, how to go about creating change for people who make services. I think that's another interesting aspect. Well, it depends. It depends on the organization and and where the possibility for change actually really exists. I think it is in every organization. It just depends on on the culture that's already there. Sure. Type of so I think that's an interesting topic. But anyway, so to your last question. <laughs> well, thank you for that. And so, Reem, my final question that I always ask at the end of these interviews and the question is this, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, I would love for, for other people who think, uh, who, who think about these topics to take a listen to one of the episodes of my podcast, Designing for Humanity. 
because I really started to learn myself, but also to engage the design community uh, at large in the work of generating a new design frame together. It's obviously not something I'm going to do by myself, and nor is it something a small group of people should be doing. It's exactly the point. Um, you know, really see, seeking input and dialogue with people who are interested in this topic also. We, I will make sure I get all that edited up and linked up and, and give the the podcast and the, your investigation, as it were, yeah. to Designing for Humanity yeah. a big shout out. I think it's a fascinating topic. I can see, I mean, there's so, and it's very timely and um, really, really interesting. And I can see big implications for the my area and the stuff that I'm interested in. And, and I'm sure my audience yeah. will, 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 will get a lot from this as well. But on the back of that, I just want to say congratulations on the work that you do and the, and, and, and the podcast. And thank you so much for sharing your time and experience with us today. That's been splendid. You're so welcome, and talking to you has really helped me think about it. So thank you. You're very welcome. Well, that's it for another interview. I really hope you enjoyed it. Now, every time I complete one of these interviews, I learn something new, and I try and incorporate that new learning into my writing, my speaking, my workshops, and the consulting that I do for my clients. If you're interested, you can find out more about how I work with clients over at adrianswimsco.com. But one final thing before I go, please consider heading over to iTunes or whichever podcast platform you choose to use and do leave a review. Every little helps, as they say. Anyway, that's all for now. Thank you for listening and do listen in again. All the very best.